informed about policies on sexual assault. Also, the very bipartisan, important anti-trafficking bill is part of it. So I urge my colleagues in a bipartisan, historic way to reauthorize, repass the Violence Against Women Act, the Senate version. Thank you. These times expire. The gentleman from Florida. Continue to reserve. Gentleman, uh, gentlelady from New York. I am pleased to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui. The gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the gentlelady from New York for yielding me time. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support for the bipartisan Senate passed Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. Since the Violence Against Women Act first became law in 1994, the incidence of domestic violence is down more than 60 percent. It is with that same record of success that we should address the prevalence of domestic violence in underserved communities. In my district of Sacramento, we are fortunate to have an organization called WEAVE, which provides crisis intervention services to domestic violence and sexual assault victims. Recently, WEAVE admitted a woman and her eight-year-old son, Tucker, to their safe house. By the time Tucker reached the safe house, his father's verbal abuse had convinced him that he was stupid and insignificant. For an eight-year-old boy to no longer smile, to play games, to enjoy life is heartbreaking. Fortunately, Tucker's mother rescued herself and her son by using the resources that the Violence Against Women Act makes available. Tucker is now living away from his father, in counseling, and on his way to a happy and healthy future. Time and time again, we hear that programs like this break the cycle of domestic violence. We must view this legislation not just as a woman's issue, but as a family issue, as a community issue that touches all our lives. It is essential for all past and future victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking that we strengthen and reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. I urge my colleagues to reauthorize an all-inclusive version of the Violence Against Women Act, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from New York reserves. The gentleman from Florida. Continue to reserve. Reserves. The gentlelady from New York. I'm pleased, uh, Mr. Speaker, to yield a minute and a half to the gentlewoman from Nevada, Ms. Titus. The gentlelady is uh, recognized for one and a half minutes. Mr. Green from Texas. Thank you, Ms. Lawler. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to support the rule but oppose the House Republican substitute and to urge my colleagues to vote for the Real Violence Against Women Act's reauthorization. This passed the Senate with overwhelming bipartisan support. Real VAWA focuses on key programs to address sexual assault, including the backlog in testing rape kits. It also consolidates programs to ensure that resources are reaching victim services and local law enforcement, and it ensures protection for all victims of abuse and silence. In Nevada, nearly half of all women have been the victim of some kind of sexual assault, and more than a quarter have been the victim of rape. The Rape Crisis Center in Las Vegas, an excellent organization that I've worked with closely over the years, assist victims in the transition to become survivors. This Congress should support the center's efforts, not hinder them. Violence against women is not a game. It is time for House Republicans to stop playing games and to reauthorize this vital legislation now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from New York reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from Florida continue to reserve. continues to reserve. The gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. The gentleman is recognized for a minute and a half. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you so much for the time. Isn't it ironic that today the Supreme Court of the United States of America is considering Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in terms of whether it will continue to apply to the United States of America and those specific states and areas that are included therein. This is being done at the same time we are considering the Violence Against Women Act, which in my opinion should be called a Family Violence Act. And I say this because we cannot exclude people because of their sexual orientation. 
This is my watch. I have a duty to stand up for those who are being left out or left behind. This act should include the LGBT community and any substitute that would remove the LGBT community is a substitute that I cannot support. Isn't it ironic that today Supreme Court is considering Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and we just had a statue of Rosa Parks made available to the public in Statuary Hall. Friends, it's time for us to come up to the standards of this time and let's bring all of our people with us. The LGBT community merits our consideration. I will not vote for the substitute. I support the LGBT community. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from New York reserves. The gentleman from Florida Continue to continues reserve. to reserve. The gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Maryland to discuss the, pre the previous question. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen is a distinguished ranking member of the Committee on the Budget from Maryland. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, Ranking Member Slaughter, and I hope uh, tomorrow uh, this House will finally have a chance to vote on the bipartisan Senate bill to prevent violence against women. I hope tomorrow we'll also have a chance uh, to vote on a proposal uh, that we've now put forward three times this year to replace the sequester. Unfortunately, the rule reported out of the House Rules Committee denies us that opportunity. So let's just remind people what will happen starting March 1st. Starting March 1st, if this House does not take action to replace the sequester, we will lose 750,000 American jobs between March 1st and the end of this year. Those are not my numbers. Those are not President Obama's numbers. Those are the numbers from the bipartisan, by the nonpartisan, independent Congressional Budget Office. 750,000 fewer American jobs by the end of this year if we don't replace the sequester. This majority in this House has not taken any action this year in this Congress to prevent that sequester from happening beginning Friday. Not one step. We have now asked three times for the opportunity to vote on our alternative. So what's our alternative, Mr. Speaker? Our alternative would replace the sequester with a balanced mix of cuts and revenue generated by closing tax loopholes and tax preferences that benefit the very wealthy. So very specifically, because it's a concrete proposal, we would get rid of the direct payments that go to agribusinesses, something that used to be have bipartisan support, because that's an unnecessary subsidy that has outlived its purpose. So that's a cut. We also say we no longer need taxpayer subsidies for the big oil companies. Guess what? That's an idea that was proposed by President Bush, who said, Taxpayers should no longer be giving these big breaks to big oil companies. They don't need that extra taxpayer incentive in order to keep producing oil and making record profits. So we do that. And then we say to folks who are making $2 million a year that we're going to limit the number of preferences you can take. We're going to limit the number of tax breaks that you take that allow you to effectively pay a lower rate than the people who work for you. So if you're making two million dollars or more per year, we say you should pay an effective tax rate of 30 percent. And if you take that combination of targeted cuts, I ask for another uh, a minute. Uh, I am pleased I to yield, gentlemen, two minutes. Gentlemen, recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slaughter. If you take that balanced combination of targeted cuts and the elimination of tax breaks that disproportionately benefit very wealthy people, guess what happens? You get the same deficit reduction over the budget window. So you reduce the deficit by the same amount as you would get if you allow the sequester to take place throughout this year. But you do it in a way that does not lose 750000 American jobs. You do it in a way that does not cause 
disruption at our airports in a way that does not cause disruption to our food safety system, in a way that does not cause disruption to the nurses who are caring for our veterans in military hospitals and veterans hospitals around this country, in a way that does not disrupt our military operations. So, Mr. Speaker, we just have a simple question. Why is it that as we gather here Wednesday, we're denied the opportunity to even have a vote on this alternative, this balanced alternative to prevent the loss of 750,000 American jobs? We're not asking members of this House to vote for our alternative, although we think it's a good one and would urge them to do so. We're simply asking that in the People's House, we have a vote on an alternative to something that will create these great job losses and this great disruption. And I think the American people are going to ask themselves why we were not even granted that opportunity with less than three days to go before we hit that across-the-board sequester, which is just Washington speak for massive job loss and massive economic disruption. In addition to the job loss, according to the Independent Congressional Budget Office, it will cause one-third less economic output in the United States of America in this year, at a time when the economy remains very fragile. So I ask finally, Mr. Speaker, give us that opportunity at least to vote so people have a choice to prevent the sequester. And I thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentlelady uh, from New York, the ranking member of the, the rules. The gentleman's committee. time has expired. The general lady from New York reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from Florida continues to reserve. Continues to reserve his time. The general lady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to yield one minute to the gentlewoman from California, the Democratic leader, Ms. Pelosi. General lady is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the general lady for yielding and for her leadership as the senior Democrat on the uh, rules committee. Uh, today we have an interesting discussion. We are debating the rule uh, that will enable us to bring to the floor the Violence Against Women Act. As part of the debate on the rule, we are asking to, uh, to uh, know on the previous question, which will enable us also to not only vote on the Violence Against Women Act, but at that completion to go on to uh, voting on the proposal that the Democrats have to uh, resolve the sequester issue. I'll start uh, first, though, with the Violence Against Women Act. Yeah, as of yesterday, it was over 500 days uh, since the Violence Against Women Act had expired. The reauthorization is long overdue. Last year, the Senate, in a bipartisan way, passed a bill uh, that was uh, uh, comprehensive that did the job. Uh, the Senate, the House Republicans resisted that. Here we are again this year, last week, the, House the, Senate, the Senate in a bipartisan way passed 78 to 22, the Violence Against Women Act, which is comprehensive and, and does the job. Uh, that means 78% of the Senate voted, 78% of the Senate voted for this uh, Violence Against Women Act. It means also that all of the women in the Senate, Democrats and Republicans alike, voted for this act. It also means that a majority of the Republicans in the Senate, majority of the Republicans in the Senate voted for this Comprehensive Violence Against Women Act. So the Senate has passed it overwhelmingly with the majority of Republicans supporting it. Uh, the President stands ready to sign it. Democrats in the House support it. Uh, we have our own, uh, we'll call upon that, uh, our leadership of, of Gwen Moore, uh, who has a similar bill in the House. We stand ready to support the Senate version. The Senate has passed it. We support it. The President's ready to sign it. Once again, the Republicans in the House are the obstacle to passing this legislation. It's, a, I, I just, it's really hard to explain to anyone why we would say to the women of America, women of America, step forward. We are stopping violence against women, not so fast if you're an immigrant, not so fast if you're a member of the LGBT community, not so fast if you're a Native American. What is that? Violence against some women but not others. And quite frankly, the groups that are excluded by the House bill are the groups that are in most need of protection against violence. So I would hope that uh, 
in the course of, uh, of the debate that we will move on to on the Violence Against Women Act that we will all open our hearts to what is uh, needed to reduce violence in the lives of America's women. In the meantime, we have a procedure uh, that is uh, not preferable, preferable. We have asked over and over again, as the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Howland, has said, this is really the third time we're asked to get a vote on a democratic alternative. The American people want to know why, why can't we uh, pass something to avoid sequester, sequestration. Uh, we uh, have this proposal that is, that is fair, that does make cuts, that does produce revenue, that does uh, not uh, uh, impede growth with jobs in our economy. And all we want is a vote. Why, can't, why do we have to beg hat in hand for a vote on the floor of the House in this marketplace of ideas? What are the Republicans afraid of? They may be afraid that it will win because it is, makes so much sense that their, their members may be attracted to vote for it. Or they may not want to put their members on record voting against something that is so balanced, that is so common sense driven, that is a solution. A solution to sequestration. What does sequestration mean? Well, whatever it means, this is what it equals. Sequestration equals unemployment. Sequestration equals job loss. And we just ca we cannot have a, a slowing down of our economic growth. We cannot afford the set losing the 700,000 jobs. That's the low estimate uh, that has been put forth by economists and by the Congressional Budget Office itself. So all we're hoping is that on the uh, previous question, we urge people to vote no on the previous question, which means that we would then be allowed uh, to come to the floor to take up the Violence Against Women Act and also to take up uh, the sequestration bill. It is um, uh, really something that deserves debate on the floor of the House. The Republican leadership has said, well, we voted on that last year. Last year was another Congress. That Congress ended. How to make a law. Congress ends a new Congress. We have an election. A new Congress begins. The Constitution says bills that relate to revenue or uh, to appropriations must begin in the House. So they say we did it last year. Doesn't count. Let the Senate begin. That's not what the Constitution says. So let us take our responsibility and not be afraid uh, of the, uh, the ideas uh, that people sent us here to discuss. We don't have to agree on every point, but we certainly should have a, an opportunity on the floor of the House. People across the country are talking about this. You can't turn on the, any media without them talking about this. The only place we can't talk about it or get a vote on it is on the floor of the House of Representatives. Just plain wrong. I urge a no vote uh, on the uh, previous question and I, I, a no vote on the Republican Violence Against Women Act and a yes vote on the bipartisan Senate bill when we have an opportunity to vote on that. And with that, I yield back to the distinguished uh, the ranking member. Of the expired. the gentlelady from New York reserves, the gentleman from Florida. Continue to reserve. Continues to reserve, the gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield 15 seconds to Mr. Van Hollen for a clarification. And following that, we'll yield two minutes to Ms. Washman Schultz, the gentlelady from Florida. The gentleman is recognized. Mm -hmm. by Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just three numbers. One, 750,000 fewer American jobs, cutting growth in GDP by one-third. Not economic output, but growth in GDP by one-third. That's one number. Second number, three, the number of times we've tried to get a vote on this. Third number, zero, the number of times our Republican colleagues have this year tried to resolve this sequester issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of this comprehensive and bipartisan effort to end violence against women. The Violence Against Women Act, recently passed by the Senate, properly updates this crucial legislation for the 21st century by providing necessary resources and support to all victims of domestic violence, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. An overwhelming 78 senators, including 23 Republicans, recognize the need for these protections, and I'm thrilled that we are finally moving to recognize the same. I'd like to express my gratitude to the champions of this bill in the House, including the gentlelady from New York. Several of my colleagues and I, along with hundreds of groups and thousands of concerned citizens all across the country, have worked tirelessly these past few weeks to make sure 
The voices of survivors and advocates could be heard over partisan debate. That is why the bill we consider today reflects the needs of vulnerable populations that have been ignored in the past. It will give Native American tribes the tools to hold abusers accountable, LGBT survivors the protection they need to access services, and immigrant survivors the independence necessary to escape violence. I am proud to vote in favor of a comprehensive Violence Against Women Act for my constituents and for my children, my daughters, and I urge all of my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from New York has five and six and a half minutes remaining and reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from Florida. Reserved balance. Reserves his time. Gentleman, uh, gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I have no further requests for time. Can I inquire of my colleague if he has any more requests for time? Uh, I do not. If not, then I'm prepared to close. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this has been a wonderful day for us in some way because we are finally debating the Violence Against Women Act with a great possibility of passing the Senate bill, uh, which will protect all women in the United States and not just some. And it's terribly important that we do that. And I, I think we may have caused some confusion there as we talk about violence against women. And we're also talking about the, the previous question which deals purely with sequestration, and I'd like to close speaking about that. Uh, I think everyone understands our importance that we've attached to the Violence Against Women Act, uh, and, but we are also very much concerned about sequestration. The reason we have brought it up on a previous question on the Violence Against Women Act is we've had absolutely no other opportunity to bring it up. The American public has been told over and over again that this House twice has passed legislation dealing with sequestering. All of us know, I'm not sure all the public knows, but let me make it clear that anything done before December 31st of last year is no longer valid. Nothing has been done this term to stop the sequestration. The only effort that has been made to do so has been done by Mr. Van Hollen, the ranking member of the Budget Committee. He has a very moderate request, one that does not do great harm either to the employment situation in the country or to the output of GDP, and what he said was terribly important. What we are about to embark on here is totally unknown. We know that it's bad. I think everybody's understood it's bad. And why we would continue to do it is beyond my imagination. But let me make it absolutely clear here. No opportunity has been given to our side of the House to even attempt to deal with sequestration. This is it. For any member of the House of Representatives who would like to go on record saying we don't want sequestration to take place on March 1st, this is your only opportunity. So we're asking that you will vote no on the previous question so that we can at least go on record in this House and we can do our very best to stop what by all accounts, by all important economists, will be an unmitigated disaster. So if we will defeat the previous question, we will offer the amendment, which will allow the House to vote on replacing the entire sequester for 2013 with savings from specific policies that reflect a balanced approach to reducing our national deficit. A balanced approach, Mr. Speaker, not a meat ax across the board. We have to act now if we're going to avert this, cri this crisis. I can't reiterate enough, this is our only chance. If we're going to avoid the unnecessary cuts to essential programs, the time is now. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment in the record, along with extraneous material immediately prior to the votes on the previous question. Mr. Speaker, I strongly urge with, my with, colleagues with, on objection. both sides. Excuse me? Without objection. Thank you, sir. And I strongly urge all of my colleagues in this House, because none of us want to face that abyss, to vote no to defeat the previous question. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. The gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I support this rule and encourage my colleagues to support it as well. Every day, people flee their homes because of violence they suffer at the hands of a domestic partner. If there's something we can do to stop that violence to save those women and children, then we need to do it. 
Inaction is unacceptable. I've seen the consequences of doing nothing too many times when it comes to domestic violence. We before us a rule that provides the House with multiple options on how we take a stance against domestic violence right here, right now. We may not agree on which of these two visions is the best one, but I think we can all agree that something must be done. That's why I say to you, Mr. Speaker, support the rule before us today. If you want to do some, something, anything you need to is to start is by voting for the rule. That's the first step. That's what we need to pass first and foremost so we can, bait, can, we can debate those options. Some folks here will talk like the Senate's vision of Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act is more than they like the House alternative. Others have problems with the Senate bill and think the House's plan is the way to go forward. Either way, either way, if you want to take a stand against violence against women, then you need to support this rule. This rule is how we move to the next step, to debate the options before the House to ensure that law enforcement departments, organizations like the Dawn Center back home, and victims of domestic violence can get the support that they so desperately need. There are those that want to confuse this with another issue before this House, but this is the issue that we have today. The issue on domestic violence, domestic Violence Against Women's Act. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time and I move the previous question on the resolution. The question is on ordering the previous question on the resolution. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. The, in the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. And on that, I request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the House will stand in recess subject to the call of the chair. And when the House returns, we expect them to vote on the rules for debate on the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women.